and positive and negative fields. Water is supplied through this vertical pipe here, splits, and then comes down, pointing downwards, and ends up with a, a very, very fine, the finest hypodermic needle at the end, so that the water jet coming out of this is as fine a jet as you can get. Inside this cylinder is a cylinder of brass in order to collect the charge which is falling from here. So this cylinder is coated on the outside with paraffin wax to isolate it so that the charge doesn't leak outwards from it. This is the same cylinder and this diagonal here is a copper rod which is attached to the brass here and also attached to a strip of brass in the bottom of this receiving vessel. So the charge here is the same as the charge here. And when the water falls through, it generates either a positive or negative charge here, and the charge is reversed by the time it hits the bottom. And so a charge builds up here, let's say positive, and here negative. And according to Kelvin, <coughs> the build-up of the charge is unlimited. And over each of these, or between all this arrangement, you get a, a negative static field builds up on this side, and a positive static field builds up on this side, which can theoretically go to infinity. From each of these cylinders, there is a black cable, which is a high-tension cable. And these uh, can be used to bring the charged field to where you want to use it. For instance, on the neon tube, and on the electroscope to demonstrate the charge in falling water. The charge is transferred to the inside of this, causing the foils of the electroscope to flap. There's a charge which is transferred inside without even me touching it. And if I touch it, then it's quite strong, and it'll go on flapping like this, and as Victor Schauberger said, very good quality water would cause this to flap 150 times before it ceased doing so. But the lower the quality of the water, the fewer times it would flap. A water molecule is a dipole molecule. That means it has a positive and negative charge at each end of the molecule. And when it falls, it generates a charge because it spins. And so it generates both an electric field and a magnetic field. And this is why with a full distance of maybe two kilometers or a kilometer, uh, when rain falls onto the ground, it comes with an enormous charge in it. And this charge is imparted directly into the plant when uh, the rain hits the plant's leaves, which is why rainfall is much more productive than river irrigation water. These very small thin jets of water falling out of these hypodermic needles generates a charge. It's really a, a small thunderstorm in this machine because it demonstrates that in the clouds charges are generated by falling water which eventually ends up in the discharge of lightning. So in the thunderstorm very powerful positive and very powerful negative fields develop and they short circuit through a, a lightning strike. The water falling through here develops a charge and as like charge repel each other then at the bottom this jet starts to spread out sideways and the water will actually start coming up again and then going down again so in this movement you can begin to see why there are such strong up and down drafts in thunderstorms. And this of course is a very, very small scale and I have, using this device, generated a spark which will jump across a distance of two centimeters. Every millimeter jumped represents 2,000 volts. So the two centimeters that I achieved with this device represents 40,000 volt discharge.
I can only say if you happen to hang on to it yourself, you really jump. There seemed to be a correlation between altitude and the length of the spark gap. There also may be other variables such as air humidity and air temperature as well. from the outside inwards instead of the inside outwards which is what's happening with all conventional propellers think in three dimensions in a very complex geometrical system which can't be described by the straight line circle and point 